J. Michael Show. Welcome to the show. Our guest today is Peter Jersik. And uh, from Tron to Babylon 5, he has been a star in several shows going way back to the 70s. So let's, uh, let's say hello to Peter Jersik. Hey, Jay. How are you? I'm so happy to be here with you and your audience. Uh, you know, as I as I said to you right before we started, whatever subjects you want to touch on there, that sounds of interest to me. We can talk about, uh, you know, all the way back to the beginning and uh, or we can, you know, talk about the future of America or whatever else you want to talk about. Right. Well, that I'm sounds with you. good. I'm happy I wanna, to be here. Thank you. I want to talk to you about your career. I mean, uh, MASH, I think, was one of the first things maybe I saw you on was was many years ago. So uh -huh. what all have you been doing? Uh, you mean what am I doing now? Yes. What are you doing now? Well, right now, uh, I, I, I about a year ago, I discovered I started to get some um, some health problems that were triggered by light. Uh, there was their seizure problems. So I have not been in, in front of a camera and I don't know that I ever will be in front of a camera again. Uh, or, and, and that includes being on stage or, uh, uh, in, on a, you know, a sound stage or a TV stage. I, I get I get triggered into these uh, seizures and uh, I don't I really don't want to do that. To a to an audience or to a director or anybody else, so I'm not I, I'm not doing anything, and that's just perfectly fine by me. It's it, it happened in a natural way, as you know from my resume. I've been an actor my whole life. I've been really lucky, worked a ton of jobs on all sorts of stuff. So the last thing I do now, I can still do voiceover work, and I saw my agent at a St. Patty's Day bar two nights ago, and she said, oh, I'm going to send you up for voiceover work still, keep you going. And I just did the uh, the Babylon voiceover piece, the animated thing. So that's where I'm at now. Basically, I'm a retired actor now, and, and that's perfectly okay by me. You know, I, as I said, I'm really one of the lucky guys, and I've been doing it for so long. Studied to be an actor, uh, worked in New York when I started out on stage, and uh, and then you know uh, how many years now? Uh, you know I moved to California in seventy five or seventy six and started working. And as I said, it's, it's so much of it is a roll of the dice, Jay. You know, right. really, it right. really good people who never get a shot at it. And I, I, you know, I went to school and I was prepared and all that. But you got to have good luck and you have to run into the people and you got to be right for the role then and all that. So, you know, there, there you have it. But um, before you retired, you were teaching, right? I was. I was. Uh, I, I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina. And uh, when I got here, uh, we uh, our son was only three. That was uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, we ran into people who were teachers over there, and they said, "Gee, you're in our town now. Wanna wanna teach?" I was still acting then too. So, and there's a wonderful studio here in Wilmington. It used to be called uh, uh, Holly, Hollywood East, but it's not Atlanta's Hollywood East now. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, you know, I, I when I first got here, I worked on uh, One Tree Hill on. Uh, um, the, the, the the shows that were in town, anything that came town in town that I was right for, they would be nice enough to hire me. So I worked a good deal there. But uh, the people at the University of North Carolina Wilmington said, "Want to teach?" And I thought, I don't know if I have anything to teach, but you know, if you want to put me in front of a class, I did. So I had a great time, and I love that. And the only reason I'm not teaching now is for the same reason. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to have a seizure in front of somebody, and right. I don't need to. You right. know, you have to look after your health first. Well, I look after my health, and also it's, it's not going to be fun if your teacher's sick. You know, it's not going to be fun if your actor's sick, right? So exactly, exactly. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about. Though. I really did. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you have done. And well, let's go back to Hill Street Blues, and you were you were Sid the Snitch on Hill Street Blues. Tell me about yeah. filming that series and uh, just just let's talk about that for a moment. Well, uh, you know, again, I had gotten to uh, I had gotten to Los Angeles, I think in 
76. I grew up in, in New York so the, and went to school in New England, but started my career there, but then eventually got myself out to the West Coast. And one of the first uh, producers I ran into was uh, Stephen Bochco. He was mm -hmm. the creator and producer of, uh, of Hill Street Blues and a lot of other great shows, if you look him up. Mm -hmm. God rest his soul now, but um, and I worked with him on a show that James Earl Jones, uh, our our famous da Darth Vader voice, mm -hmm. everybody knows who James Earl yes. Jones did with Stephen called. It was called. Um, gee, I should pull my resume out. I can't <laughs> remember what the, the name of it was. Um, anyway, he hired me, and interesting enough, I played a school teacher for him. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, was, uh, you know, hanging out with, uh, I'm going to pull my resume so I can find that thing for you. I'll be right back for you, okay? Sounds good. Sounds good. Go ahead and get that. And, of course, we're going to be talking about Babylon 5 and yeah. Tron and Crom uh, in Tron, I believe it was. And well, I've I got have... a question I want to ask you about Londo when you get back. I'm back. I, I I can't find the resume. Oh, I know what it was called. That first show was called Paris. It was a TV show with James Earl Jones. I think he was a detective. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that connected with with uh, Stephen Bochco, and Stephen Bochco said to me, uh, you know, I'd love to use you on, I got a new show on Hill Street. And at that point, I was he was offering me pretty straight characters, you know, got little lawyer guys and stuff like that. And I said to him, you know, Stephen, I really would love to play a more interesting guy. I didn't think I'd get someone as interesting as Sid the Snitch, but I did. And, uh, you know, I love Sid. He was a great character. And, and Stephen uh, had just gotten a new writer then. Uh, named David Milch, who became quite famous. David Milch did NYPD Blue, did a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, he was, the, because I was a new character and he was a new writer, he started to write for that character. So I had great scripts too. I mean, Sid was a guy who'd do anything for 20 bucks, as you know, Jay. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I can relate. <laughs> so I, I was watching a clip last night of you as Sid the Snitch, and I oh, noticed I, that the voice of Sid the Snitch seemed like almost like Londo. Tell me where the voice of Londo came from. Well, Sid, I basically was just doing um, a, a New York accent. Londo was interesting because I got the script for it, uh, the uh, the casting director and uh, sent me the script and um, I read the script and I liked it a lot but I had never really done uh, any uh, real work as an alien I'd worked in Tron but we were we were kind of little earth creatures if you remember bits mm -hmm. and all that so I called the 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 uh, casting director back and said ask Joe Straczynski what he'd like the guy to sound like uh, the character. Mm -hmm. And Joe Straczynski got back to me and said, I don't care what he sounds like. You'll be the first Centauri. So uh, you're the first Centauri. So you, whatever you want him to sound like, he can sound like. And so uh, I just thought that was a wonderful opportunity to, to make something up. I had just done a play downtown. It was a Tennessee Williams play. Mm -hmm. um, and I was playing a, a lawyer from Memphis in uh, a Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Uh, Pat Hengel was in it. Kirstie Alley was in it. Mm -hmm. Jim Morrison was in it. Anyway, good people. And uh, I had worked really hard on my Southern accent. And when the reviews came out, some reviewer in L.A. said, that was a terrible Southern accent Peter did. That wasn't very good. And I thought I had done really well. And so when uh, when Joe said I could make up an accent, I thought, good, no one's ever going to be able to tell me this isn't what a Centauri sounds like. Uh, or no, I'll, I'll never get a bad review for the for the for the dialogue. I mean, for the uh, for the accent. So I just made it up out of whole cloth, uh -huh. you know, I really did. It kind I of, added a little, it, um, it's kind of almost a Russian accent. That's right. I mean, I like that he was sort of uh, that look. I, I mean, I saw they saw they gave Andreas and people uh, when we were auditioned. Andreas and I auditioned at the same time, but they gave us little drawings of people. And I, you know, I realized that he, you know, he was all the, all that that military get up and mm -hmm. all that. And uh, 
in the drawings he had very short hair, kind of like Patagia had. Mm-hmm. But uh, but but I don't know. I felt like he was sort of Eastern European and sort of grand, uh, you know. And there was a tradition, as you know, about, among the Centauri that way, you know, families and all that. So, and I'm Slovak, so I used a little of my grandmother's accent. Her Slovak accent, and, and I and I, I I used to love going to Ireland at that point in my career. I just loved Ireland as a place to vacation, to get away from Hollywood, uh, have a beer, and just uh, you know listen to music, which I really loved. And uh, so I used Irish rhythms in it, and uh, yeah, just made it up. Speaking, that's, that's just being honest. Speaking, you know? speaking of music, and I see a guitar in your background there. Do you play? And also, you had a CD out at one time. Uh, well, yes, I do play, but I don't play uh, professionally. And I love music so much. I uh, What do they say? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like a sophomore. I know that I don't know. Mm-hmm. So I play, but I wouldn't dare play. For, I, I might play for you because you and I are friends, mm-hmm. Jay, but I'm not going to play for the public. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, my son went to college and uh, studied guitar, so he's really good. But, oh, I see you got your guitar back there, too. Mm-hmm. You got a bunch of them. Un- unfortunately, I can't play them as well as some can, but I do like collecting them. Oh, that is fun. Well, the the album you referenced is uh, something Bill Moomy did and put together for the Babylon Five people. And he's he you if you haven't chatted with him, you should because he's the ultimate uh, guitar collector. He's got more guitars hanging in on his wall, like you have behind you. I mean, you'd love a visit to Bill Moomy's house. He's just got guitars forever. I will definitely put him on my list of people to interview. So let's move forward. He's got a great career, and Mm -hmm. he's a really interesting guy, and especially if you're a guitar collector. You, you, You probably could spend, you know, a whole two hours just walking around talking about his guitars. I mean, he's a serious collector. I would absolutely love that. And he is a heck of a musician. I mean, he writes, he plays, uh, he used to tour with America. He's a wonderful guy. Yeah, and he used to, when we, when we did Babylon, Jay, all the Earth uh, people, the normal people, got made up in one trailer. Mm. And so, um, Jerry, Jerry Doyle and, and Claudia and Bruce were in one trailer, but all the alien characters got made up in another trailer because we had another group of special effect makeup people. And so Bill was there and I was there. Andreas was there. Mira was there. And Bill used to bring the best, this, this really dates me, but the best mixed tapes mm-hmm. you in the world. Remember little cassette tapes right. and you put your own music? Well, Bill had great taste and he had an incredible collection. As you said, he's quite a musician. So he brought in all, he would bring in the tapes and he just wowed us. We had great music when we were getting made up. Uh, when you're getting made up for a character like Londo or Jakar or, or even made up, you really can't talk at all. You just have to sit quietly mm-hmm. and let them basically do their work on your face. It's like a painter painting on your face, you know? And so you just need to be the canvas mm-hmm. and just relax and just sit there. So g- having good music was really important. That's how Bill got us to do these uh, the tapes. He, he had at some point said, I'll write songs, and uh, if I can get you, Peter, Andres, I guess Mira and Claudia and I did the B5s. Yeah, it was fun. We had a great time. And it fulfilled the fantasy for me of, uh, you know, standing in front of a microphone and singing. I wasn't very good, but I had a good time doing it. (laughs) Um, When you're in the chair, you're getting your makeup and all done. How much of your hair is Londo's hair and how much of it is wig? None of my hair was was uh, Londo's hair. The mm-hmm. very first thing, uh, the people who designed the makeup, uh, they were called Optic Nerve, and, and and they they did they they tried to figure out in the pilot what the hair was going to be like. But the guy who came on the show, his name was Greg Funk. Is that not a great name, Greg really? Funk? Really, and he was from Pittsburgh, and he had worked on the movie uh, Night of the Living Dead as a kid. The kid makeup artist, kind of. Wow. He's a young man. 
And he got hired by Babylon 5. He eventually got nominated for Academy Award for some other show. But he won an Emmy for My uh, my Makeup. And that's because what he decided to do was the hair was so big and so heavy that the first thing he would put on me was a complete bald cap. So he'd take all my hair, comb it all down, and then he'd take a full bald cap and he'd put it on and set it on my head. Now, the you would say, oh, well, that's a good start. But when he did that, that that big wig would start to pull that that head piece up. And this is why he won an, uh, an Emmy. He decided to make the, the, the line of the wig run right here. Mm -hmm. It would go from over my ears. So it hung on my ears, basically. It went right over my eyelids, right over the top of my nose. And so the first part of Londo's makeup was just to make him completely bald. Mm -hmm. and a really good, secure uh, headpiece. And then, uh, you know, some two two pretty girls who were from uh, from England would work on the Londo wig the whole time while I was sitting getting made up. And then they'd, they'd come over and put, put it on like a big coronation, look like, you know, Elizabeth II's coronation or Charles. <laughs> they'd come over and just stick it on my head. It was fun and great. How long did so it that take? Was, How long did, did you sit in the chair for to become Londo? How long did it take? Um, it took about two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. and, um, but as I said, it was a very pleasant time. Greg was really good, very hardworking. Uh, you didn't, uh, you, you couldn't talk, you couldn't eat, you couldn't sleep. So you just had to basically get into what a kind of quiet meditative uh I, I i'm not a prayer too much but a prayerful state contemplative state and you just get relaxed and i love that because you could run your lines in your head but uh but you needed to be quiet and it gets you got you get you know it's really a peaceful thing i just relaxed and loved it i liked it and i love to listen to music as i said so uh -huh. you know uh, well you're on the set of babylon five do you have any stories of of what is the, like the funniest thing to you that happened on set? Well, now, Jay, this is a hard question. A lot of people ask that, but all I can tell you is that we were not a, a cast that we didn't have any practical jokers, particularly who were trying to make people uh, laugh. So the things that were really funny. Uh, were really spontaneous moments that just just happened. There were some people. Claudia was was an absolute pisser, and she's funny. She was great, and she loved to make people laugh. And Jerry Doyle was very much of. He wasn't a prankster, but he wasn't really a trained actor. Mm -hmm. You know, he had come from Wall Street and all that, and so he, he had been have a cab driver. Huh? He was a cab driver at one time. Yeah, that's right. He was a cab driver. Exactly. He's buried back uh, in New Jersey. I think he drove a cab uh, mm -hmm. in the East, on the East Coast, too. Yeah. And um, he, so he, he didn't, well, I, this is the wrong way to say it. I don't mean it in the wrong way, but he wasn't a trained actor. So he didn't have good actor's manners on a set. He was just loose, funny, made, had the best time. So, the funny things that happened, uh, you know, if they were purposeful, were Jerry and Claudia. But uh, we, the rest of us just had a good time. And I, I don't know what to say other than Stephen First was such a genuinely funny guy. Mm -hmm. And he and I had a very similar sense of humor. So we were, uh, we, we, you know, we were just as happy as two clams, uh, you know, uh, be on a set together and we laughed more than people would look around like what the hell's going on with these two what are they <laughs> laughing at? you know because we enjoyed each other and we had a sense of humor uh, alike uh, andreas was a much more serious guy mm -hmm. um, and he loved uh, i'm sure you've heard this or the people who know babylon five have heard that you know he he wasn't a a method actor really but he stayed in character very much as uh, Jacquard, he liked to stay uh, kind of in the work mode. Mm -hmm. So he'd come in in the morning and during that quote meditative period that I told you where we were getting made up and his, his was a full makeup. Remember what he, you know, he had a whole mask mm -hmm. that went on. Um, 
he would get very much into character and, and he stayed in character. So he was pretty serious. Occasionally the cigarettes would come out mm-hmm. and your car would start smoking. But uh, only occasionally would he, he really get to fool around. And we started to be able, I was somebody who could do that with him. We had a good time together. We liked each other. We became friends over the course of the show. So, right. But, you know, in terms of an exact story to make you laugh and tell you this was a great moment, we had so many of them, Jay. And on top of it, you're doing a good script, Mm -hmm. right? They're giving you, JMS is writing the scripts for us. So pretty interesting stuff to be doing. And they're paying you well. I mean, you know, what, 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 what's not to be happy about, right? right. Smile. Right. You need joke. Absolutely. We were pretty happy. We were well, pretty happy. Too. On the set of any show you've done, did you ever get nervous that, oh my gosh, I'm going to be acting with this person? Um, at some point, I don't know that I ever really, some of the biggest stars I worked with, uh, would work to make you feel, I, I did a, television movie with Burt Lancaster. Now, Burt Lancaster's a, you know, plain old big movie star when mm-hmm. I worked with him. And that's a big name. But he worked to make people around him be at ease. Uh, when I did MASH, you mentioned MASH. Alan Holt is a pretty big star. Mm-hmm. He uh, he he helped me. Uh, he, he helped everyone. He, he was a bit of a cut-up. He liked to make people smile. So... Well, they people who are who are regulars on a show, and you know, I've been I was a regular on a couple of shows. You know, that's part of your your job to mm-hmm. help the guest actors, the people who come in, mm-hmm. uh, calm down and be relaxed. One of the very first guests I did was I did uh, two or three Barney Millers, uh, right? Right. And uh, and Hal Linden was Barney Miller. And what can I tell you about him other than he actually, and I, you know, I'm nobody, just some actor from New York. Uh, he really took the time to help me. He'd say, that's your camera over there. It was a four camera, you know, sitcom set. Right. And he'd say, that's my, that's my camera over there or that's my camera there. And you got to be careful not to, but he did it as a, you know, like a, a, a good teacher would. Mm-hmm. He was friendly nice, uh, relaxed, funny. I eventually worked on another show with him. And I think partly, I mean, I, they called me back for three different Barney Millers, but I, I did a, a show with him later. And I think he, you know, he genuinely liked me mm-hmm. because I listened to him, but what can right. I say? He never felt like a star. I worked with, uh, I don't know who else there was, um, uh, Jane Alexander. I did a, she was in couple movies you know and she was uh we were we were doing a movie with uh, emilio estevez who was uh you know i don't know whether you know him he was part of the black pack oh yeah and Mm -hmm. she was playing his mother and uh i remember the second or third day she says she said to me peter would you like to you know we'll take a break at, at noon and everybody would sit down and have lunch and usually you sat with a crew or whoever you were working with but she said would you like to have lunch with me today and i thought oh how nice jane alexander <laughs> wants to have lunch with me <laughs> but what she did is she spent the whole time rather than just talking about who i was and she was although she did that a little bit, she just talked about the work and said, no, well, here's what, here's what our scenes are. And it was, you know, such, so generous. And that really made you relax. Right. You know, uh, as I said, Burt Lancaster was a big star. And uh, I mentioned someone was nice enough to put me in a biography of his, but he had trouble with his lines. He had a big, long scene in this movie. Henry Winkler produced the movie. And I was friends with Henry and, had worked with him before and um you know Bert was a big star and 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 this was a big long scene around a big table mm-hmm. with a lot of other actors for the life of me couldn't remember the the words oh, and goodness. right yeah. and, and and you know that's that's an interesting spot for him to be in it's you a know? horrible First spot of, yeah for an actor yeah he was older than I am now so you you, you get forgetful I'm already losing my you know I, I i i can't remember lines like i used to but the director said to him bert you know what i can do i can sh- shoot this in little pieces there's so many people around the table we can cut you up really 
mm-hmm. carefully. And he was, he said in front of everybody, he said, no, no, I'm, I, I can do this. It's just going to take a little work and you're going to have to be patient with me. And uh, he said, I'm just a regular actor. I'd like to do it as a whole. And if he says, if I make mistakes, I'll make mistakes. Now, come on, man. What do you want Burt Lancaster to say? Exactly. Except, you know, he also, the very first scene I had with him in that movie, it was called Scandal Sheet. I played his right-hand man, and it was about, you know, uh, uh, exploitive newspapers like National Enquirer and stuff. Right. And I, ha- I, I, I had a scene where I was on a phone to call into him. We were out in the desert outside of L.A., and he stayed around and did the off-camera stuff for me. Rather than take a, a you know, a, a ride back into town, he said, no, I'll stay and I'll do the other side of the phone call for Peter. Wow. No, I don't know what to say. Yeah, huh? That was nice to yeah, to give up his that own was time. Nice. Yeah. That was the first that was the first day we worked together on that movie, too. That's that's how why you don't get nervous around people to right. answer your question. Because people are kind enough and generous enough, and most people are smart enough to know how lucky we all are to do that job, too. Right. As I said, they're paying you on top of it, right? Are are most actors very kind like when you get on the set i met jerry dole years ago at at a convention and he said i'm sure he said this to other people too but he said the only difference between me and you is i'm on tv and i thought that just really resonated with me and it took all of that you know oh my god it's a star you know to me the actors are regular people so you're as kind as you are in any situation, correct? And Jay, you know, that's you're exactly right. And you answered your own question there, or mm-hmm. with a little help from Jerry. The people who are, are, if you're a genuinely kind, nice person, then you're grateful for your work. You're happy to be there. You're glad you're getting paid. And uh, you keep your head about you, uh, uh, you know, about it's just you're just on TV. Right. And but people who are idiots or selfish or uh, not particularly nice people, there's plenty of them. And uh, and they act that way. There are people who do who are not nice people to be around. And uh, have you ever sometimes have fame, you ever acted the fame with, and the celebrity? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Have you ever acted with someone that? you afterwards said, I will never act with that guy again. Uh, if I did, I would never tell you. That. <laughs> <laughs> Can't give up that secret. I, I, I don't, I, 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 I don't uh, kiss and tell, and I don't act and tell. So you'll never get any of that out of me. Although probably there are, I mean, it'd be crazy to say that I had a career, uh, you know, hundreds of episodes of TV and, uh, you know, 40 or 50 movies and stuff that I didn't have people who were not fun to be. Stephen first was a joy, as I said, to be with. And yes, there were plenty of people who were not so much fun to be on a set with, especially if you're an actor, like I did a lot of guesting on Mm -hmm. other shows. I think I did 40 or 50 guests on different shows. And you need to have your head about you in terms of there are people above you Mm -hmm. and got to be respectful of that and get in there and shut up and do your work and do a good job. Right. Right. Uh, and, 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 and if you're good at that, you get hired again. And I, I believe that's why I got hired and worked as much as I did. I feel like I had the right headset, whether I got that from my dad, I don't know. I probably from my dad or my mom, you know, just learn to, you know, do your work. Um, just like you're doing right now, Jay, you know, mm-hmm. just be a regular person, right? Right. There's nothing. It, it, some people can't do it, but, you know. Exactly. Okay, so you're doing the movie Tron and you're crom and everything is going to be all blown out of colors and it's like you're in a you're a digital character. Tell me about filming Tron and your experiences with that. Gee, that's such a wonderful time to think back on. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, it was, um, you know, first of all, it was kind of a unique movie in terms of a sci-fi piece for Disney to do. You know, Disney at that point really didn't do anything but kind of animation, their right. stuff. So to do a live action piece like that. And uh, Steve Lisberger, who wrote it and directed it, 
uh, also did uh, he you know all this computer generation it was first it was the first wave of that mm -hmm. so we didn't even know what we were doing and um, again you talk about big stars so the first person uh, that I think of was uh, was Jeff Bridges and I met Jeff Bridges and uh, you know you could be nervous about meeting him but talk about a guy put you at ease right he's such a relaxed dude and uh, the he dude, was right? the dude he was the dude <laughs> uh, but I remember we had the first reading and we met and uh, he said to me hey want to sneak down the hall he's he, he you know I, we started talking about music and he said you you know the music room is right down the hall you want to sneak down the hall and play some guitar <laughs> and I thought yeah, I do. And we went down and we just jammed and hung out while we were hanging out together. Now, again, you talk about the experience, but that's a nice memory for me. Right. That was really sweet of him to do and a very relaxed guy. And that's because of, you know, what kind of heart he has or what kind of brain, how he approaches it. So he was really fun to work with. And uh, uh, one of the people in this in the, in the movie whose character was Ram... He was one of the guys on the motorcycle was uh, Dan Shore. Mm -hmm. Dan Shore and I both got cast in the movie because uh, Dan and I had worked together in New York and were friends. I cast him in a play I was directing and uh, we hung out together. Our, uh, you know, we, we really were friends in L.A. And we went to a party for a friend in Santa Monica. Both the producer and Steve Lisberg were at the party, and those were the days back in 1976 when you could still get in that way. Uh -huh. And that, and those, those guys just talked to us at a party over a beer, you know, and said, "Hey, we're doing a movie for Disney, and we don't know what it's going to be like, but uh, you know." And, and both Dan and I both got that job because of that party, meeting those two guys. And they were so just, you know, just nice, good, got, you know, relaxed about the fact they didn't know what it was going to be, Tron. And it right. got panned, came out, as you remember. People thought it was terrible or didn't get it. But, you know, David Warner, really great actor. Uh, Box Lightner was a big, it was a big deal for him, but Jeff Bridges and... <clears throat> It was really fun and how we work, which, uh, you know, I won't bore you with it technically, but the sets were, um, they were completely empty. There was nothing there. Right. So it was, like, it was like being on a, uh, a playground as a kid, mm -hmm. Tron was, because everything was going to be computer generated and every, everything around you was this green, light green color, because that was the green screen behind right. you. They had to chroma key those, everything. They had chroma keyed everything. And that was really interesting to do, to see those people keep that clean mm -hmm. and that and our costumes clean. And and then Steve, it was the first time I ever saw somebody use a a, a, a book with pictures in it to show you what the scene was going to be about. So he would he would he would have it all drawn out. He'd say, Here's here's what the scene looks like. You're over here. Bruce is over here. There's a thing about the, uh, the, 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 you know, that ring game that we played. Right. Uh, he explained that to us, but there was nothing there. You know, there was nothing coming down. So it was like being a kid on a playground. You had to imagine it. So they don't normally show you the storyboards when you're doing a, a film? That was the first movie I ever saw a storyboard on. Uh, I, I don't remember anyone. Now it's common, of course, people have storyboards and show people uh, the scenes. But that was, I, get, I don't know, you probably could tell, figure out when that was, when was Tron made. But that was the first time I ran into a storyboard. I hadn't seen a storyboard. It would have been in the 80s, right? Yeah, 80, early 80s. Okay. And, and you know, it was necessary. Uh, it, it, it's not particularly necessary on other movies, but it was particularly necessary in Tron because, as I said, there was nothing on the set. It was all chroma key, as you said, and, mm -hmm. you know, it was empty. So he would, Steve would explain the scene to us, and then we would be like uh, kids on a playground, make it up. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw the ball to you, and you make believe you catch it. Yeah, and, uh, you know, that's one of the things about Babylon 5 is they didn't do a whole lot of 
chroma key where there's a character there that you can't actually see, but you're supposed to be acting and talking to that character. Um, right. That that would be a very strange thing to do on camera. It is a little strange, but uh, I mean, we had those little uh, figures that would show up uh, on on Babylon Five. Sometimes people would have a little character appear, like when the techno mages. I had those scenes with the techno mages. Mm -hmm. He uh, he he caught me lying, caught Londo lying, and he had, he had a little. So you do that, but you know, for an actor, that's just your work, man. That's just as ordinary as the day is long. You know, it's just an easy thing to do. You just got to concentrate. And uh, and focus and and use your training. As I said, I, I spent uh, you know four years getting a a degree in acting. I know it sounds crazy, but I did at the University of New Hampshire. So you know, I actually worked on it. So, and do you uh, have a lot of communication with the writers when you're on set? Well, that varies from writer to writer. Uh, Joe Straczynski was was very particular who he was and uh, how we communicated him. But you started when you went back to Hill Street Blues, and I mentioned uh, David Milch, mm -hmm. who did Deadwood and, um, you know, NYPD. And uh, we was a fabulous uh, writer, and he was new on that show. And he would not leave me alone. He would follow me around when I would talk with Dennis Franz or wherever, whoever I was with my scene. He would hang around and listen to people talk. And then all at once, whatever you were talking about or whatever you were dealing with would show up in, this, in the next script. And maybe, maybe in a little twisted or distorted form, but he was listening to people. And, and Joe was just the opposite of that. Joe Straczynski... He'd come out every single day, uh, uh, almost every single day, and have lunch with us, mm -hmm. uh, which was great. And it was really nice. And he's not that, uh, he's not the most sociable guy, meaning I don't know that he's comfortable as a conversationalist. You and I don't seem to have any trouble talking, you and I. So mm -hmm. we're both, you're a good conversationalist or you're not in life. Uh, and yeah, right. and he, so he didn't particularly like that. But I'll tell you this. He went in, came in in the morning, worked and wrote, and nobody bothered him, and he didn't listen to you. I mean, David Milch was maybe over my shoulder listening and getting some ideas about Sid the Snitch, but uh, not not JMS. JMS, he knew what he wanted those characters to do. That The idea of having the full arc, or what he called the Bible of characters, if you wanted to look at it, he'd let you see it. He that was real. He had that. He knew where he was going. He had it all show. in his head, the whole five year arc. It's crazy to think about. Yeah. And if you look at how many how many he wrote, he didn't not very many other people wrote stuff. I mean, that's grueling work. Right. But he knew where he was going. And so he didn't listen very much. Uh, as I said, I went in one time to complain about a line. Mm -hmm. And I mean the typical actor. I don't know that my character would say this kind of right. BS. Mm -hmm. So I, I went down. By the time I got in there, I was uh, nervous to talk to him anyway about it. And uh, he he sat me down. He listened. He said, go ahead, Peter. You you tell me what you want. Want a cup of coffee? Or can I get you something? It was very, very personable. And I, and I did my whole rap. Mm -hmm. about i don't even remember what it was about and he said well thank you for letting me know and i'm not changing anything but uh, thank you for coming <laughs> <laughs> well Tom, I mean, you just made it clear as day jake you know i'm not changing anything <laughs> i'm glad you told me yeah. and i'm glad you don't like it thanks for telling me but right i appreciate your input and it will go in file 13 that's exactly right. Exactly. Thank you so much for the input. <laughs> exactly. Well, transitioning from actor to writer, you wrote a book called Diplomatic Act, and I yeah. want you to tell us about that book. Well, that was an interesting experience because I'm not really a writer. I've made many attempts to be a writer, but I don't have the personality to be a writer. I can't... Uh, you need you need to you need to be a real hard worker mm -hmm. and you need to be genuinely creative 
to be a writer. I mean, they're making this stuff up and, and it's coming out of that, uh, you know, the wellspring of creativity, as Bob Dylan says. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't know where it's coming from. It's just coming from. Uh, so you got to do that. And you have to be willing to write, rewrite, and rewrite again, and then trust when it's finished. Like, I, my, my wife is a painter. And most of the time, I can't figure out when she's done. I'll, she'll show me something she's working on. And I'll think, oh, I guess that's it. Well, she can paint on that for, you know, weeks more. Just fixing this and fixing that. So exactly. when I was off to do that book, it was a nice opportunity. But I was I was set up with a, uh, a real writer. Um, and we co-wrote together. And he was smart enough. We took a, uh, a storyline. I guess it's kind of a famous story. I mean, I mean, not famous. Uh, well, it reflects it reflects a lot of what became Galaxy Quest. Did your book inspire that? Maybe. Um, now that's a that, that's kind of a touchy question, but I'll be honest with you and tell you uh, that I think it did. I mean, they took my book and uh, once it was done and they passed it around in script form to a lot of different people and they saw it mm -hmm. and uh galaxy quest was a fabulous movie and had a much better idea than i had for this film anyway because they didn't just take one character like in my book the guy who was uh, the diplomat who became the diplomat uh, they took a whole cast, and that was brilliant, and it was funny. But yeah, I can say that, and uh, I don't think I don't, uh, you know. I don't know. I'm not going to sue them, and never would have sold, sued them anyway. But yeah, it got around town, I think, and I had a big enough agent that enough people looked at it, so it may have had some influence. And it, it's also still available on Amazon, right? You, you can buy it. Absolutely. I don't know that it's really how good a book it is. I mean, occasionally people ask me, as I said. He was a really good writer, and I wrote the stuff that I knew, the part of the, the book that was on the set. And uh, so I, th I think it's pretty good. I don't know that those two pieces ever really married together and worked out that well. But I sure had a great time doing it, and I loved it. And if it taught me anything, uh, it taught me how hard it, – it reminded me how tough it is to write. Right? Writing to is writer. really – huh? To, to be, be a writer, a writer yes. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this also. Um, the three, writer, theater work, television screen work, of the three, which is your, which do you prefer? Yeah, that, uh, they're all uh, so completely different. Um, performing on stage was something that I was schooled at. I started my career in New York. Mm -hmm. So I really love stage acting. It's a, uh, it's about uh, giving the actor the not the, not the ultimate power, but it gives you the chance to interact with an audience live, and that's a really interesting thing. It's like being a comedian or being a performer who's singing to an audience. You're you you got you got live people in front of you, so the action there is really what's happening between you and them. Right. That doesn't exist in TV acting. And at first, that's a little odd because you do it. And if you're doing a comedy, there's nobody laughing. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you do Barney Miller. And I guess they're, you know, they'll, but there's nobody there to laugh. Sometimes they would have audiences. But you know what I mean. Yeah. They put in the laugh track the drama, later. You assume people are, are being touched by the work or understand or being scared by whatever you're doing or whatever the movie theme is. But um the truth of the matter is I eventually got to like uh, TV best, more than film, more than the stage, and more because I like the speed of it, mm -hmm. and that really appealed to me. I, I certainly loved having an audience there, but I also loved, and I think this is why I, uh, I, I would say it's my favorite, it's so fast, TV. What's great about it is you do it, and it's gone. Right. And the, ne the next day... They are not doing it again, like they'll sometimes do. I mean, Andreas talked about working with Woody Allen, and they went and did back. They went back and did the scene three, four, five times. I mean, completely different. Months later, mm -hmm. uh, television is so fast. You know, we we used to have. I guess we had nine days to make an episode. I mean, there's really no time to. You know, I mean, you're moving on. 
when they say moving on, they mean you're moving on mm -hmm. to the next scene. And it's very rare, unless some some major technical mistake happens, to go back. And I really like that, Jay. I enjoyed that. That's fun. That's very spontaneous. And uh, you you have no time to sit around and say, okay, I don't know how whether I like that and what do I you you just just get on with it, boy. You know, <laughs> and I like that. It, it's also steady work. I mean, every episode you're getting paid. You got it. I really like that about it too. I, I, I'm I'm the type of person who have I have a good work ethic, ethic, and I you can tell already that as I said, I enjoy being on a set. I enjoy being on a set. I like the people around you. You're you're in a big team of people. Plus, uh, you know, I found a way to get along with uh, the people I work with, or I just genuinely like them, as I mentioned. And then, yeah, the bonus is there's a big old check at the end of the week. And, uh, and I love that. You know, that was great. That was fun uh, to do. I like that about TV. And, and you didn't get to – the amount of sitting around is a lot less in television. Right. It's just, it's just moving along quicker. When my, when my son was born, uh, Joe wanted um, my wife and I to have time to be with our – our uh, son, he he said, "You're going to enjoy this time, or you were, your wife's going to need you there, and all that anyway." When we first uh, the baby first came, and so he said, oh, "You know, I'm just going to write you out of the next uh, uh, three months of the of of making the television thing." And, and so it was <laughs> weird. He basically, I mean, the, the episodes were going along, but my work was surgically removed. And then I had to go back and put it back in. But that never happens. And and I must genuinely say, I love being with my little boy, but I miss the work. I like the work. Yeah, right. the steady work. I mean, I told like you at that. the top of this that I'm not going to be able to act anymore. And I, the only reason I can say genuinely I don't feel badly about that is that I had such a, so much good work. Mm -hmm. So much, so many different uh, parts and television shows and actors who I got to work as. So I don't have any regrets about anything particularly. So that's why I can let it go. But I, I really liked it. I like TV best. Right. Well, we were talking about the character of Londo and his voice. And uh, would it be possible to hear a little Londo right now? Jay, my good and dear friend, why would you ask me to? Uh... <laughs> I, as you know, I do cameos, so I don't even do Londo that well anymore. But I can, I can fake it pretty well. I can do. Uh, I, I, I did one this morning for somebody who had an anniversary. Mm -hmm. uh, one of these cameos, and uh, so I said to a, uh, it was their silver anniversary, and I said, as Londo, I said to them. You know, I know something about marriages. I was married. As you remember me telling Veer, I had three wives, famine, pestilence, and death. And as I said to Veer, do you think I married them for their personalities? Oh, no. Their personalities could shatter entire planets. No, the secret to our marriages is we stayed 17 light years apart. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's a little bit of Londo for you. And, you know, I, 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 I said, and I wasn't kidding, at the beginning, just to get into character, I used to say, Mr. Garibaldi, or my good and dear friend. Those were, those were um, templates, or I don't know what the word is, to mm -hmm. cue me into him. So I still can do those and then remember it. And, you know, I love that pilot script, so I love the stuff about... Uh, uh, my God, man, we have become an amusement park. <laughs> Open nine nine to five, Earth time. You know, that right. was fun. I, and I genuinely love those saying those words, so they stick in my head. So, so As I those, said, there are probably you and a lot of other people who can do a better Londo than me now. I, I can't <laughs> do I can't do Londo. But so you had triggers to kind of help you get back into that character. I did. I, I, I had a physical tr trigger that was um, how he walked and with my body. And that was just because of the way I was trained as an actor at the, back at the University of New Hampshire, I mentioned, the four years. The teacher I had, uh, he taught character leaps that way. So uh, one of my triggers was to walk around 
as him because I felt like he had a very specific walk and he had a very specific mannerisms. Now, to me, that may be true. My wife said, ah, Peter was all typecasting. You're perfect. You are Londo. Now, uh, but for me, it felt like I had to get there. And the, the accent was very important. And yeah, one of the earliest things was my good and dear friend and Mr. Garibaldi. And so I use that, or I would use lines to to kind of cue myself into his headspace again. Uh-huh. He was not a he was not a uh, he was not a very relaxed man. Wow. Right. That's all I'll say. He's he nervous. Pretty, huh? He's nervous. Nervous. Uh uh, a lot of a lot of enthusiasm, intensity. So it wasn't you. Had, you, you know, it wasn't. He's not really me. I, I think I'm much more of a uh, just a normal guy, more relaxed. He was pretty high level energy. You had to get up for him. You had to get up for him. You know. Right. After Babylon Five, did you feel typecast in that role? No, I, I never worried about that. There were people who. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of my my career, I don't think uh, I had I became Babylon never became popular enough to cause me to be typecast. Plus, people had seen me do pretty weird stuff. I mean, Sid the Snitch is a pretty different character, actually, than Londa Malari. That, that's pretty different. And I played a lot. If you go back over my career, I played a lot of really straight guys, as I told you. Some people in suits, lawyers, doctors, scientists, really straight people that were more reflective of who, who I am, uh, a kid who grew up in New York. And I don't know. Everybody, everybody assumed this nose and this hair that I was Jewish. And I'm not Jewish, but I got I got the benefit of that. So, uh, you know, I, I got cast in a lot of uh, th- those kind of roles, lawyers, doctors. Uh, right. And um, no, I never worried about uh, typecasting. Anybody who type, types, you know, a career has an arc. And again, without sounding, you know, ridiculous about it, I was lucky and I got a lot of good breaks. So, and, and I had a lot of work after Babylon. So I was... I was uh, I was lucky that way. But I mean, when I came here, I told you I did One Tree Hill and and uh, whatever the other thing was called. Uh, but they cast me as a really straight guy. No problems, you know. Yeah, you can't worry about that stuff. I I, I threw myself in a hundred percent on whatever I did, uh, just because that's my nature too. So I was like, you can't back off of Londo. Right. Yeah, but but kinda, you're a very you know, good, a very creative actor, the kind of actor that can fall into pretty much any kind of role. So I'm sure that helps you. Boy, that's really true. Uh, I, it was really nice that people were able to see me not only as a comedian. I started out when I first got to Los Angeles in a comedy group. Um, you were and, doing nightclubs, uh, right? You were doing nightclubs. I was doing nightclubs. Yeah, uh, I mean, two nights ago on uh, on Billy Kimmel, uh, Michael Keaton brought in a little thing. He was in the comedy group with me mm-hmm. uh, of Batman fame, and he brought in. He played one of our things. It was silly comedy, mm-hmm. but uh, he played it on Billy on on, on uh, Jimmy Kimmel, not Billy Kimmel, Jimmy Kimmel on Monday, the night after the Oscars, and uh, it was just goofy. Uh, you know, it was sketch comedy. That's all. And uh, I, I was really lucky that people didn't typecast me as that. I mean, you know, uh, eventually somebody said, you know, maybe this guy can play something serious or something heavy. And so they moved me toward the uh, Londo, uh, not Londo. Uh, Sid did that in a funny way. He was funny. And he was a comedic character within the range of the Hill Street characters. Mm-hmm. But they, they gave that, uh, uh, um, Dennis and I some serious work to do. And that let people see, oh, this is an actor who can do more serious work too, you know? So Which, when you were doing the comedy club things in Los Angeles, were you also auditioning or were you kind of discovered on that stage? Um, it was pretty heady, heady stuff. Um, we, uh, I was part of that comedy group, the village idiots. We were lucky enough to get a gig on Don Kirshner's rock concert, which was a Saturday night, 
uh, uh, rock concert show. The best thing about it, they didn't pay us very much, but we got to sit around and watch the concerts when they tape. So I got to see Bob Marley. And I got to see uh, Steely Dan. I got to see, see a lot of people sit right in the front. And that wow. was fun. And um, we, did a, we did a lot of comedy. And um, again, you know, uh, did I get discovered there? Well, at some point, I guess, the first guest I told you I did outside of the group was Stephen Bottrell gave me a serious role in Paris mm -hmm. with James Earl Jones. And I don't know who was casting Barney Miller, but somebody called me up and said, you want to do a Barney Miller? And so uh, I was lucky enough out of that comedy group. And at some point I decided to leave the group and that went over like a, a you know, a lead balloon. Right. They didn't, they were pretty unhappy that I was leaving, but eventually all, all things must pass as George Harrison says. Right? right. So it was okay to let it go at some point, but I mean, that was pretty heady time. I have uh, my friend, Bill Kirkenbauer sent me a, a little list and uh, I have it in my phone somewhere, but it was the, uh, the Sunday night lineup at, um, at the sunset comedy store. Uh, Robin Williams went on right after us. David Letterman went on right before us. Uh, Jay Leno was on that list. Bill Kirkenbauer was on that list. I mean, they were everybody was just getting started. Nobody was a star yet. The first pilot I ever did, a pilot is a is a test episode for a series, was a Jimmy Walker show called The Star Show. Mm -hmm. They used the Village Idiots, David Letterman, Jay Leno. And, uh, you know, they had all of us under contract. No one, I don't, I don't think NBC would ever admit that, but they, they had Letterman and Leno at one point and they let him go. Wow. You know? Well, you were talking yeah. about being sent that list. Do you have and keep, uh, props or paraphernalia or something from the shows you've been on? I do a little bit. Uh, I, uh, I still have, uh, I still have that. The, my call sheet from that show because just because of the Letterman Leno thing. I think that's cool that they were on the show and, you know, they were called at two and I was called at two thirty, and, and then, you know, Leno was called at three. That's fun to have. It's a nice memory right. for me. And I'm not a guy who uh, collected, I mean, Bill Moomy, Bill Moomy would, would, he would save everything. He just looked, he would save his scripts and uh -huh. because uh, he had been, through, you know, he, he'd been in the business a long time, obviously lost in space. And right. he knew that this was valuable stuff and that eventually you could sell it and people would be interested in it. But um, he uh, he'd save everything. He when they took his headpiece off mm -hmm. as uh, Lanier, he would save it. He would flip it over and and write the date in it and sign it. Wow. And I'm going to. Right. And he saved every one of those. Now let me show you something. Okay. I wanted to. I wanted to uh, save something from the Babylon set. So, oh, wow. can you see that? Yeah, I that see was it. In, uh, that was in Londo's quarters, and I thought, gee, I really like that. It's just, it's just made of wood. It's just a cheap little prop because it was in the background. No one ever saw it. But when, I, when in the, at the end of the the the, the fifth season, I said to. Uh, to the set design people, I said, could I have this as a memory? You know, now I've done 110 episodes. You'd think that Warner Brothers said, no, nah, you need to write a, a, a note and get a, uh, get a, we'll write a letter and uh, we'll, we'll consider it and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can give it to it. So they made me write a letter, ask for it, and then actually wrote back and said, no, you can't have it. We decided, we, we looked it over and we considered it and you couldn't have it. And and people like and of course Jerry's on the other side, so I would not lie. People like Jerry were just Jerry Doyle were taking stuff left, left and right off the set, and a lot of people were doing that. But I didn't uh, particularly want to do that. But I eventually I lifted this despite Warner Brothers. And then uh, it wasn't maybe I don't know two or three years after that somebody at a convention handed me a Warner Brothers auction, and I realized that every single thing on all these shows get put to an auction. And, uh, you know, my my costume was sold for, you know, yeah, a lot of money. A lot of money. 
Huh? A lot of money. Yeah. I know. So that's why they didn't give it up because they wanted to, you know, sell it all. But anyway, that's the, that, that, that's the story of this little guy, how I got him. They made me write a letter and told me no, and I took it anyway. <laughs> 110 episodes, I'm taking this. Well, at some point, right, you feel like, oh, come on. Yeah, really. You know, right? Well, uh, yeah, I'll, absolutely. I would just, just, I'd probably be like the others. I'd be stealing things left and right. <laughs> Jerry was just taking stuff left and right. Yeah. He didn't care. He didn't care. Um, but, like, if someone wanted to get an autographed photo from you, uh, there are ways to get that also right well there is a fella i don't even like to advertise him that much but he was one of these people who um now i, I shouldn't say that because he gave us all cut but he before the show got popular he uh, a nice guy up in washington and he was a very nice guy but he he uh grabbed all of our domain names mm -hmm. and so www.peterjurisic.com is his, and andreaskatsoulis.com is his, and Mira Furlan is his. And uh, even years later now, how long ago was the show? 25 years? Right. A long time. He doesn't want to give them up and will not give them up. And uh, and that I feel that that's, that's, that's not very kind of him. So people can get, get uh, pictures there. Um, I don't know where else. Pat Tallman... Uh, gets the legitimate stuff. I was going to ask you about Pat because she's she's working with you to sell uh, autograph photos. That's right? right. That's right. And she has real legitimate stuff. And uh, so she's probably the best source. Once in a while, if I run into somebody or, uh, you know, like you that I know, Jay, then, I you know, if somebody asks me for a picture, I'll pen them a picture off and send it because I still have stuff, um, you know, around. But I think Pat's probably the best source. She has a lot of good stuff. And uh, and I have some memorabilia. I have some funny little, those little dolls. I have some Londo t-shirts. You know, fun stuff that you would like. Right. I uh, have an action, an action figure. If know? someone wants a cameo, they can get a cameo from you also. They sure can. And I'm happy to do cameos. As I, I've let people know this. Most of the ones that I do, I do as Londo, the little bit that I said. I, you know, I try to be in character because I know Londo is many, many times more interesting than me as a guy. <laughs> you like Peter Jurisic, you and I would get on because yeah. we, we listen to music together and have a good time, Jay. But you know, I'm I'm, not, I'm just a regular guy. But Londo's a lot more interesting. So if you if you go on Cameo, I will do it as Londo or whatever you want. Then I, you know, can can do. Uh, I, you know, I've done a couple of Hills for Hill Street Blues fans. Um, so, you know, I can do any of those characters for people, or I can just talk as Peter Jurisic, you know, kind of boring though. Well, I'll you know, put a link below. I don't this, have so. the big hair, you know? Exactly. So I will put a link below this podcast so people can go and get a cameo. And, uh, but you said that you don't actually control your website, right? Um, I, you know, I, it doesn't matter. I don't really control it. Uh, I think he can still get stuff through him, but he certainly hasn't been in contact. And I don't, I don't hold him against it. You know, he could release him, but I think about people who are gone now, and he, and he didn't, he didn't do it for you know Mira, and he didn't do it for Andreas, and didn't do it for Jerry. And I, I feel badly about that. I mean, you know, the, he held on to it. And now they're gone, but uh, I don't, I don't, I don't let it bother me. As I said, you're kind to put a link to Cameo. Uh, through Cameo, you can get an, an actual Cameo done. And Pat Tallman, uh, she, she can, she, she has all our stuff. Anybody wants a picture, they can get it. Or you can bother this guy, Jay, and uh, <laughs> he can track me down. I think I'll find you somewhere. It's, speaking That's of right. the way I found you, of course, is Facebook. Do you have a Facebook page? I do. I, 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 as you know, because you're my friend, I get hijacked a lot and I get cloned a lot and all that. So uh, it's not as easy to be on Facebook as I wish it were. I, that was my own stupidity. Early on, I said, I don't have anything to hide. What do I care? You know, I don't have to worry about security. Famous last words, right? Right. So, uh, 
but I am on Facebook and you can you know say hello. I I have so many uh, so many friends now that I don't really take that many on uh, new because I just can't keep up with you know the amount of stuff. I'm getting old. You know? <laughs> I am getting old. I think Facebook also limits how many you can have. Is that right? Yeah. That, Bill Mooney has so number. many people. God bless him. He just took a break from Facebook. But and you know, he would put he posts songs every morning. And you know, he's he's he, he's a hard worker. I don't know that I'm uh, I don't I don't I don't think I'm willing to work that hard. <laughs> he does the so, Monday Mooney uh, a different song that's every right. Monday. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, Peter, it yeah. has been wonderful having you as a guest today. I hope we can do this again. You Thank are you, an a, incredible, accomplished actor, writer, and uh, have you ever Thank produced? You I didn't ask you that. Did you produce anything? Hello? No, I've never produced anything, no. I've done radio work, and I'm pretty much a one-trip pony in terms of performer kind of stuff that's really what i do but you're so complimentary and thank you so much this couldn't be a nicer time you're such a relaxed uh easy person jay thank you for being that well thank you for being my guest peter jersey okay. and uh check out his uh cameo check out uh, all the tv shows movies he's been in and we will see you next time on the jay michael show Goodbye.